This is my second video update. In the first update I showed you how I start my seeds, label my crosses, and set the plants in the tent. So far I've been really impressed with this FC3000 LED fixture that was donated by Mars Hydro. Uh, it's 300 watts and it is providing pretty good results for the plants. Uh, the first time I tried to grow peppers indoors was under a 100 watt quantum board and the results were pretty mixed and poor altogether. Plants that were directly under the light did alright, but anything outside that footprint didn't really get enough light to develop properly. So what's new? Uh, it's been about three weeks since the last video and all of the crosses have uh, some seeds that have germinated, if not all. And uh, my seed starting mix doesn't have any nutrients in it, so to speak. And so starting on the second week, I began bottom watering with a quarter strength fertilizer. Uh, I'm using a, a water soluble triple 20 and just applying a small amount with each major watering. I wanted to get them set up with their basic needs early on versus waiting too long and risking stunting the plants. And in addition to the fertilizer, I've also been bottom watering with a natural bacterial predator of fungus gnats. And uh, you can get this bacteria which is called Bacillus thuringiensis subspecies israelensis in a bunch of product formulations, but I found a dry, a dry powder product that dissolves in water. Uh, in the past, I've had major problems controlling these soil-borne fly larvae that eat the roots of your plants, and this stuff works really well regardless of the product you use. Uh, I've been applying it proactively this year to keep them uh, from getting at my seedlings. I should note though that uh, Bt doesn't survive very long in the soil, and so you need to apply this product something like every three days if you're actively treating an infestation, but just follow the directions on whatever product you're using. So as you can see, uh, the plants are growing really well. The biggest problem I, ha I have right now is that the fertilizer applications have been promoting the growth of gray mold, uh, also known as botrytis mold. And gray mold is super common and it's present in the household environment. So even if you start with sterile soil, you can still end up with gray mold colonizing your soil, especially if the environment promotes its growth, which is to say it's warm and humid, which is exactly what we need to maintain for our seedlings to germinate. Uh, as the soil is staying moist for two to three days at this point, having mold colonize the soil is kind of inevitable. Uh, fortunately, one of the Redditors in the uh, pepper breeding sub recommended using hydrogen peroxide. And so based on some advice I found on Google, and that's how I like to make all my critical life decisions, you know, don't ask an expert, just Google it. Um, I mixed up a 15% dilution of household peroxide in water, and I've been spraying the soil surface. And it's been successful at keeping the mold at bay for about a day. And so I've taken to spraying the uh, peroxide dilution every morning, which gives things time to dry during the day, and it's kept my seedlings alive and thriving. Uh, if you do go down this road, uh, you'll need to make a fresh dilution of the peroxide every day, as it seems to react with the water and is no longer effective on the second day. So I thought I would show you guys what gray mold looks like on soil. And so on the left is a container I treated this morning where the mycelium is no longer visible. And then on the right is a container I left to show you guys what the mold looks like. And you can see the entire surface of the soil, uh, especially in, in like regions around here, is covered by this grayish white fuzz. And under magnification you would see that there are these little uh, fungal fibers called mycelium. And so in the earliest stages you'll see a small circular sector of the soil that has these gray white fibers on the surface and then if you wait another day or even you know 18 hours it'll probably start looking like the soil on the right here uh, and again and I'll just demonstrate for you here uh, you just spray the soil surface to uh, to knock back the fungus and you just want to do you know just enough to saturate the surface of the soil make sure you get every part and if you get a little on the plants, uh, it doesn't seem to hurt them too bad. Uh, these are my seedlings of yellow Brazilian starfish crossed to sugar rush peach. And this was the only Bacatum cross I was able to make this summer. And so like many of the Bacatum varieties, uh, these seeds were a little bit slow to germinate, uh, but only four or five days slower compared to the Chinense crosses. Um, what's fascinating about this cross is that even the seedlings, you know, having only their cotyledonary leaves, demonstrate nyctinasty. And this is the movement of plants in response to the onset of night. 
And so this is the kind of movement that you see in things like prayer plants uh, of the genus Calathea. Uh, but what's really fascinating is that these plants, they're in a tent, they're under 300 watts of light, and they get very little outside light coming in. Um, and they start to close up their cotyledons around, you know, the natural dusk, which is about two hours before the lights turn off. And so I don't know what controls this, but I think it's pretty cool that it apparently happens without a light cue. Uh, it might be some kind of circadian system tuning or, or something interesting like that. So I snuck in here at night to show you. So these are the leaves closed up. These are the cotyledonary leaves closed up. We should see this all through the uh, vegetative growth that at night it will close up its leaves. Uh, but anyways, moving on. Okay, so here's a cross that, uh, that I wasn't able to share with you guys as I only had four seedlings from it. And this is Ahichara pita, crossed to pink habanero long. Um, and what I wanted to point out here is that neither of the parents, Ahicharapita or Pink Habanero, have the R gene for anthocyanin accumulation. Uh, but if you look at the back right here, we do have one seedling uh, that is accumulating anthocyanin. And so how we got this seedling is uh, likely the result of pollen contamination. And so pollen contamination is when you get unwanted pollen onto the stigma of an emasculated flower that you're using for crosses. And so this can occur by wind or it can occur by insect. Uh, but the most likely explanation is that I, I transferred the pollen onto the stigma either with the tweezers that I was using for emasculation or with the tool that I was using to deliver the pollen to the cross. And so that being the case, this is probably a hybrid with Fidalgo Roja or Shira Roja by SC. And being that I already have crosses that I suspect are ACP by uh, FDR and CRS, I'm probably going to end up culling the seedling in the coming weeks. Uh, the rest of the crosses are all growing and developing well. The crosses with Ahicharapita are a little bit on the smaller side and they took a little bit longer to germinate, uh, but they are growing strong. So here's the first of the two crosses where we expect to get the purple colored seedlings. And this is uh, Shira Roja by SC crossed to Ahicharapita and then Ahicharapita crossed to uh, what I call CRS for short. So as you can see, we are getting the purple colored seedlings. Uh, several of the seedlings are still green, uh, but I'm not too worried yet. Uh, the purple coloration can take a while to develop as it's a response to light. And uh, if you look close at these little green seedlings, you'll actually see that they are starting to turn purple. So I'll give them a little bit more time and uh, just make sure that they're the expected cross. So here's the second set of crosses where we expect to have uh, purple colored seedlings. And as you can see with both of the crosses, all of the seedlings do have the purple coloration. Uh, even when we use Ahicharapita as the mother, these are the crosses on the left, all of the seedlings are purple. So again, the R gene is dominant and we are getting the expected crosses here. I'll probably give these guys about another week or two and then thin them out to one plant per pot. And then I'll end up growing out two plants each. Uh, as I've only got about 10 square feet to work with, I'll have to keep my plant numbers pretty low. The rest of the crosses were all green by green, and so there's not much to look at in the way of morphological markers right now. On the left, we have habanata crossed to ahicharapita, and on the right, we have ahicharapita crossed to habanata. Both directions of the cross created healthy green plants, uh, but you can see the crosses with ahicharapita as the mother are significantly smaller and further behind in development, although they are growing well, and I'm encouraged by that. I'm excited for the F2 generations with both of these crosses as I expect them to segregate for the recessive capsinoid knockout, as well as hopefully uh, the unique flavors contributed by both parents. I think this is going to be a great cross for us, regardless of the fact that it's not going to result in a, a pink fleshed pepper. So that's going to be it for today. I hope you enjoyed the video. And if you could, like, subscribe, and share this video. It would really help the cause. Uh, please feel free to come find us on Reddit or leave your comments and questions below. Uh, with that, I'll just say good growing and goodbye.